My name is Jose Rodriguez, and I am 34 years old, and what I'm about to tell you happened back in the summer of 1995. I was 28, recently divorced, and trying to find myself again. My cousin Horace and I decided to spend a weekend hiking in the Ozarks. We'd grown up together in Missouri, and these mountains held a lot of memories for us, mostly good ones. We figured some fresh air and a little adventure would be the perfect way to clear our heads. Horace had always been the outdoors type, while I was more of a city guy. I worked as a mechanic in Kansas City, fixing cars and getting greasy every day. My ex-wife used to joke that I loved my wrench set more than her, and maybe she wasn't wrong. But here I was, trudging up a mountain trail with a pack on my back, trying to prove I could be more than just a grease monkey. We started our hike from a small town called Jasper. It's a quiet place, tucked away from the hustle and bustle, with locals who wave at strangers and a diner that serves the best apple pie I've ever tasted. Horace and I hit the trail early, laughing and reminiscing about our teenage years, when we'd camp out in his backyard and tell ghost stories until we fell asleep. The first day was uneventful. We set up camp by a stream, roasted some hot dogs, and cracked open a couple of beers. The air was cool, and the sound of water running over the rocks was soothing. It felt good to be away from everything, to just sit and breathe without worrying about the next day's work or the awkward silences of a failed marriage. The second day, we decided to push deeper into the woods. Horace had this crazy idea about finding an old cabin our granddad had built back in the 1940s. We weren't sure if it was still standing or even if we were heading in the right direction, but it gave us something to aim for. The deeper we went, the denser the forest became. The path, if you could even call it that, was overgrown and difficult to follow. We hacked our way through with machetes, joking about how we were modern-day explorers. By late afternoon, the sun dipped below the treetops, casting long shadows that made everything look eerie and unfamiliar. We finally stumbled upon a clearing. In the center stood a dilapidated cabin barely recognizable under a thick blanket of ivy and moss. The roof had caved in on one side and the windows were long gone. But it was there, a relic of our family's past. Well, I'll be damned, Horace said, wiping sweat from his brow. We found it. We set up camp nearby, deciding to spend the night there. As we unpacked, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. I brushed it off as nerves. After all, we were miles from civilization and the woods have a way of playing tricks on your mind. Night fell, and we lit a fire, cooking up some beans and sharing a flask of whiskey Horace had brought along. We talked about the old days, about our granddad and the stories he'd tell us about this place. We laughed, but it felt forced. The feeling of being watched was growing stronger. Around midnight, we heard a rustling in the bushes. We both froze, staring into the darkness beyond the firelight. Probably just a raccoon, Horace said, but I could hear the uncertainty in his voice. Then came the smell, pungent and rotten like something long dead. I gagged, covering my nose with my shirt. What the hell is that? I whispered. Horace shook his head, reaching for the hunting rifle he'd brought along. We heard another rustle, this time closer, followed by a low, guttural sound that made my blood run cold. It wasn't any animal I knew. Stay here, Horace said, standing up and aiming the rifle towards the noise. I wanted to stop him, tell him to sit back down, but my voice caught in my throat. He took a step towards the darkness, and then another. The fire crackled, casting dancing shadows on the trees. Suddenly there was a blur of motion, a massive shape lunging from the darkness. Horace fired a shot, but it was too late. The thing, whatever it was, hit him with the force of a freight train, sending him sprawling to the ground. I heard a scream. His scream cut off abruptly. I scrambled back, falling over my own feet as the creature turned its gaze towards me. It was huge, covered in matted fur, with eyes that gleamed like hot coals. For a moment we were frozen in place, staring at each other. Then it moved, fast and fluid, like a shadow come to life. I grabbed a burning log from the fire and swung it wildly, more out of panic than any real strategy. The thing snarled, recoiling from the flames. I used the moment to run, tearing through the forest, branches whipping at my face. I don't know how long I ran. It felt like hours, my lungs burning, legs aching. 
I tripped and fell, rolling down a slope and landing hard at the bottom. Dazed, I looked around, realizing I was lost. The forest was silent, save for my ragged breathing. I tried to gather my thoughts, figure out which way to go. But everything looked the same in the dark. I stumbled to my feet, picking a direction at random and moving as quickly and quietly as I could. Hours passed, and the adrenaline began to wear off, replaced by exhaustion and fear. My mind raced, replaying the attack over and over. Horace was dead. He had to be. That thing, whatever it was, had killed him, and it was still out there, hunting me. Just as dawn began to break, I found a dirt road. I followed it, hoping it would lead to help. Eventually, I stumbled upon a ranger station. I must have looked like a man-man, bursting in, babbling about monsters and attacks. The rangers listened, though their expressions were skeptical. They radioed for help, and soon a search party was organized. I was taken to a nearby hospital, treated for my injuries and questioned by the local authorities. I told them everything I could remember, though it felt like a fever dream. They searched the woods for days but found no trace of Horace or the creature. The cabin was just as we'd left it, but there were no signs of a struggle, no blood, no tracks. It was like we'd imagined the whole thing. Weeks turned into months and the search was eventually called off. Horace was declared missing, presumed dead. I returned to Kansas City, haunted by the memories of that night. People looked at me differently, some with pity, others with suspicion. I couldn't blame them. My story was unbelievable, even to me. Sometimes late at night I still hear that low, guttural sound, and the smell of rot and decay fills my nostrils. I moved away from Missouri, hoping distance would help, but the nightmares followed me. To this day I don't know what we encountered in those woods. Some nights I convinced myself it was just a bear or a mountain lion, something explainable. But deep down I know the truth. There's something out there, something ancient and hungry, lurking in the shadows of the Ozarks. I guess the lesson here, if there is one, is to trust your instincts. If something feels off, it probably is. And if you ever find yourself deep in the woods, far from civilization, remember this story. Stay vigilant, stay safe. And for God's sake, never hike alone. The fall of 1988 found me hitting the back roads of Tennessee. Call me Carter. I've always loved that old school RV life. Something about the freedom of the open road. Problem was, this trip felt off. Couldn't put my finger on it, just something in the back of my mind. Like I wasn't exactly alone out there. First night out, stopped in the Cherokee National Forest. It's massive. A whole lot of nothing but trees and hills. Anyway, around 3 a.m. something woke me up. Can't say what, but my skin prickled. Like those nights you swear something's breathing down your neck. I grabbed my flashlight, peered out the window. Nothing. Still, that feeling gnawed at me. By morning, the dread was heavier. Figured it was nerves, so I decided to move on. Took a hike to clear my head, maybe four or five miles in. When I got back to camp, that's when things got truly weird. There, dug into the mud around my RV, were a set of tracks. Big ones, boots, probably men's size 12 or so. What spooked me wasn't just the tracks, it was how fresh they looked. I hadn't been gone that long. Seemed someone or something had been circling my camper while I was out. I got my bearings, tried to figure out where the tracks headed off to. No luck, the forest's thick there, whoever made them disappeared like a ghost. My .38 started feeling real light in my hand, I tell you. Nervous hell, I spent hours checking around my RV, expecting to see eyes glinting in the trees. That night, I didn't get a wink of sleep. Every snap, every rustle. Sure, it was footsteps. Started hearing whispers, too, just out of reach, like someone murmuring right on the other side of the RV's thin wall. Couldn't make out the words, but the tone was pure malice. Tried to tell myself these were just tricks of the mind but deep down I knew better. Next morning I couldn't take it anymore. Had to get out of there. While prepping to leave, I found something carved into the back of the RV, deep into the metal, watching. No way in hell I was sticking around to find out what the hell that was about. I threw the RV into drive, heart in my throat. That was just the start. For days I swore I saw glimpses of someone just out of sight. A glimpse of a face in my rearview mirror, the flicker of a shadow behind a tree I passed. My stomach was in permanent knots. Then came the real nightmare. I stopped in one of those dinky little gas stations off the highway. 
figured a public place was the safest. Inside, I was browsing the aisles, trying to find something, anything to calm my nerves. I looked up and almost jumped out of my skin. A guy was staring at me through the grimy window, tall, built like a brick house, face hidden under a ball cap, but I felt his stare straighten my bones. Then he gave me this sickening smile, all teeth, no warmth. He mouthed the words, I found you. A chill went straight down my spine. I darted out of there, barely remembering to pay, slammed the RV door and peeled out of that gas station like a bat out of hell. For the next two days, I didn't stop, barely slept, barely ate, figured I was headed for a breakdown if I didn't get some help, finally reached a decent-sized town. Name was Jasper, pulled right into the local sheriff's station, figuring the police could sort this mess out, told them everything. The tracks, the whispers, the guy at the gas station. Here's where things get worse. When I described the man, the deputy young guy, name tag Reed Miller, his face went pale. Seemed he recognized the description. Then real low, he tells me they've had missing persons reports. Hikers, campers, just vanishing in the woods. Never been solved. Miller couldn't tell me anything else, said it was an ongoing investigation but the look he gave me, it said everything I needed to know. Now I don't know what's going on out there. Is there one creep or a whole group of them? Are they connected to the missing folks? Maybe some kind of cult? Whatever it is, I'm never stepping foot in those woods again. Sometimes when I'm on the road late at night, I glance in the mirror and my blood runs cold. Because for just a split second, I think I see him out there. That same hungry smile lurking in the shadows. This happened to me in 80, the summer I traded the stifling humidity of Atlanta for the towering pines of Sequoia National Park. My name is Marcos Morales, and I'm 30 years old. Always had a thing for the wilderness. Maybe it was the quiet, maybe the solitude. City life never did suit me. Sequoia was a different beast than the Georgia backwoods I'd grown up in. The trees were giants, older than history itself, casting long shadows that felt like a different kind of time. I was a rookie ranger, green as the moss on those ancient trunks, but eager to learn the ropes. The first few weeks were a routine, patrolling trails, checking permits, the usual song and dance. But then, one blistering afternoon, a call crackled over the radio. A hiker had stumbled upon something strange. It wasn't bear trouble or a lost kid. Whatever it was, it had them spooked. I drove out to the Grizzly Gulch trailhead, the sun beating down on my truck like a blacksmith's hammer. The hiker, a pale, skinny guy with a Yosemite Sam mustache, was waiting for me, shaking like a leaf. He mumbled something about a creature, something not right, lurking in the woods. I took his statement, tried to calm him down with a canteen of water and a few reassuring words. But the fear in his eyes, it stuck with me. Figured I'd better check it out, rule out any real danger. I hiked up the trail, the silence broken only by the crunch of pine needles under my boots. The gulch was known for its wildlife, but this felt different. The air hung heavy, the shadows deeper. I kept my hand on my holster, a cold comfort against the growing unease. After a mile or so, I saw it. Not the creature itself, but its mark. A tree, snapped clean in half like a toothpick. The brake was fresh, the wood still sappy. Whatever did this had strength beyond anything natural. I pushed on, my senses on high alert. The trail wound deeper into the gulch, the trees closing in like a cathedral. The light faded, the air grew colder. I felt a prickle on the back of my neck, the feeling of being watched. Then I heard it, a rustling in the underbrush, a heavy thud like footsteps, but not the kind you'd expect from a deer or a bear. These were slower, deliberate. I froze, pounding in my chest. The rustling got closer, the thuds louder. I drew my gun, the metal cold against my sweaty palm. The underbrush parted and it stepped out. It was humanoid, vaguely shaped like a man, but twisted, wrong. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, stretched tight over bulging muscles. Its eyes were black pits, devoid of light or life. It had no clothes, no weapons, just its bare, unnatural form. I raised my gun, my voice barely a whisper. Stop right there. Identify yourself. It didn't respond. It just stood there, staring at me with those empty eyes. Then it lunged. It was fast, faster than anything human. I fired, the gunshot echoing through the trees. 
The creature stumbled, a dark ichor oozing from its wound, but it didn't stop. It tackled me, its weight crushing my ribs. We rolled on the ground, a tangle of limbs in desperation. It clawed at me, its nails tearing through my uniform. I fought back, punching, kicking, trying to find a weakness. But it was like fighting a machine, relentless and unyielding. It got a hold of my arm, its grip like a vice. I screamed as it twisted, the bones snapping with a sickening crack. I tasted blood, my own, and the metallic tang of the creature's ichor. In a moment of desperation, I grabbed a rock and smashed it against the creature's head. It made a sound, a wet, gurgling noise, and its grip loosened. I scrambled away, my body screaming in pain. The creature lay still, its chest heaving. I didn't wait to see if it was dead. I stumbled back down the trail, the trees a blur, the pain a dull roar in my ears. I made it back to the trailhead, my uniform torn, my arm dangling uselessly. The hiker was long gone, smart man. I radioed for help, the words slurring in my mouth. They found me hours later, delirious and shivering. They airlifted me out, patched me up. The arm never healed right, a constant reminder of that day in the gulch. The official story was a bear attack, a cover-up to avoid panic. But I knew the truth. I'd seen it, fought it, felt its inhuman strength. I quit the park service shortly after, the wilderness losing its allure. I settled down, got a desk job, tried to forget. But the nightmares came, the creature's empty eyes staring at me in the darkness. I never went back to Sequoia. I never told anyone the full story, not until now. Maybe it's the guilt, the feeling that I let something loose on that mountain. Or maybe it's just the need to share the burden, to let the world know what lurks in the shadows. Whatever the reason, I can't keep it any longer. This is my truth, my confession, my warning. Beware the wilderness, for it holds secrets darker than you can imagine. And if you ever hear a rustling in the underbrush, a heavy thud in the silence, run. Run as fast as you can and don't look back. My name is Alejandro Flores, and I am 29 years old. And this happened to me on October 14th, 2011. I'm not much for writing, but I wanted to get this down while it's still fresh. So I'd been planning this camping trip with my buddies for a few months. We were all due for some time off, and I figured an RV trip would be the perfect getaway. The place we picked was the Black Hills in South Dakota. Not many people go there this time of year, and that's just how we liked it. My friends Paul and Dennis were excited too. Paul's a tall guy, used to play college basketball. Dennis, on the other hand, is short and stocky. But what he lacks in height, he makes up for with a loud personality. I picked them up, and we set off in my old RV, joking and laughing the whole way. We arrived at the campsite in the early afternoon. It was a small clearing surrounded by dense trees, and the nearest town was about 20 miles away. The place was quiet, almost too quiet, but we didn't mind. We set up camp, got the fire going, and cracked open some beers. We spent the evening talking about old times, our jobs, and our plans for the future. It was good to be away from everything, just us and the wilderness. After a few hours, Paul suggested we go for a night hike. I wasn't too keen on the idea, but Dennis was all for it. Come on, Randy, where's your sense of adventure? Dennis teased. Reluctantly, I agreed. We grabbed some flashlights and set off into the woods. The night was clear and the moon provided some light, but the forest was dark and eerie. We walked for about half an hour, joking around and making fun of each other's nerves. Then we heard it rustling noise coming from the bushes ahead. Probably just a deer, Paul said, though he didn't sound convinced. We pressed on, but the noise persisted. It seemed to be following us, keeping pace just out of sight. Suddenly, Dennis stopped. Did you guys see that? He whispered. I looked where he was pointing, and for a brief moment I saw a shadow dart between the trees. Let's head back, I said, feeling a knot form in my stomach. We turned around and started walking back to the RV, but the feeling of being watched stayed with us. The rustling grew louder, more insistent. Paul quickened his pace and Dennis and I followed suit. We reached the RV and I locked the door behind us, heart pounding. Maybe it was just an animal, Paul suggested, but we all knew it didn't feel right. We stayed inside the rest of the night, not talking much. I barely slept, every noise outside making me jump. The next morning, things seemed normal again. We laughed off the night's events, 
attributing it to our overactive imaginations. We spent the day hiking and exploring the area, taking photos and enjoying the fresh air. By the evening, the previous night's fear seemed like a distant memory. As the sun set, we built another fire and settled in for another night of drinking and storytelling. Dennis decided to turn in early. I'll catch you guys in the morning, he said, heading into the RV. Paul and I stayed up for a while longer, but eventually we decided to call it a night too. I was just about to head inside when I heard a noise. It was a faint, almost imperceptible whispering. I turned to Paul. Did you hear that? Hear what? he asked, looking around. That whispering, I said, straining to listen. Paul shook his head. You're hearing things, man. Let's get some sleep. We went inside, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I lay in my bunk, staring at the ceiling, listening to the sounds of the night. Just as I was about to drift off, I heard it again, whispering clearer this time. I sat up, heart racing. Paul, do you hear that? Paul grunted, half asleep. Hear what the whispering I said? My voice shaking, Paul sat up, listening. Then we both heard it a low, guttural voice speaking in a language neither of us understood. We looked at each other, eyes wide with fear. Dennis Paul shouted. Jumping out of his bunk, we ran to Dennis's bunk, but he was gone. His things were there, but there was no sign of him. We searched the RV, calling his name, but there was no response. We need to find him, I said, grabbing a flashlight. We ran outside, shouting for Dennis, but the forest was silent. We split up, searching the area around the campsite. I was about to give up when I heard Paul scream. I ran towards the sound, flashlight beam bouncing wildly. I found Paul standing over something, his face pale. He pointed with a shaking hand. On the ground was a trail of blood leading into the trees. We need to call for help, I said, pulling out my phone, but there was no signal. We followed the blood trail, our fear mounting with each step. The whispering grew louder, more insistent. It seemed to be all around us coming from the trees themselves. Finally, we came to a clearing and what we saw froze us in our tracks. Dennis was there, or what was left of him. His body was torn apart, scattered across the clearing. Standing over him was a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was tall and gaunt, with long, spindly limbs and a face twisted into a grotesque snarl. Its eyes glowed with a malevolent light, and it seemed to be watching us, waiting. Paul and I backed away slowly, but the creature stepped forward, blocking our path. Run! I shouted, shoving Paul towards the trees. We ran blindly through the forest, the creature close behind. The whispering grew louder, more frenzied. I could hear Paul's heavy breathing, his footsteps pounding the ground beside me. We burst into the clearing where our RV was parked, and I fumbled with the keys, hands shaking, and I slammed the door shut behind us. The creature slammed into the side of the RV, rocking it violently. I started the engine, flooring the gas pedal. The RV lurched forward and I drove like a madman, tearing down the narrow dirt road. We didn't stop until we reached the nearest town. We stumbled into the local sheriff's office, babbling about what had happened. The sheriff, a grizzled old man named Tom, looked skeptical but agreed to send a deputy to the campsite. We waited anxiously as the hours passed. Finally, the deputy returned looking pale and shaken. There was nothing there, he said. No blood, no body, nothing. Paul and I looked at each other, stunned. But we saw it, I insisted. We saw Dennis in that thing. The deputy shook his head. I don't know what to tell you. Maybe you boys had too much to drink. We left the sheriff's office in a daze, not knowing what to believe. Dennis was gone and there was no trace of him. We returned home, our trip cut short. Paul and I didn't talk much after that. We tried to move on, but the memory of that night haunted us. A few months later, I was doing some research, trying to make sense of what had happened. I came across a local legend, a creature known as the Nalek. According to the stories, the Nalek was a malevolent spirit that hunted those who ventured too deep into the forest. It was said to whisper to its victims, driving them mad before it struck. I don't know if what we saw was the Nalek, but I do know that something terrible happened in those woods, something I can't explain. And every now and then, when I'm alone at night, I hear the whispering, faint but unmistakable, and I wonder if it's still out there waiting. My name is Jose Rodriguez, and I'm 34 years old, and this happened to me in 1983. 
I had just moved to a small town in Wyoming, looking for a fresh start after my divorce. I was a freelance photographer, scraping by on gigs and living in a small cabin on the outskirts of town. Life was slow, and that's how I liked it. It was peaceful, with the mountains looming in the distance, and the quiet serenity of the woods surrounding me. The town itself was quaint, the kind of place where everyone knew everyone else. The locals were friendly enough, though I always felt like an outsider. I made friends with a few people, including my neighbor, Reuben Harker. Reuben was an old-timer, born and raised in the town. He had stories about everything, and I enjoyed listening to him talk about the history of the place. One evening, Reuben and I were sitting on my porch, drinking beers and watching the sun set over the mountains. The conversation turned to local legends, and Reuben started talking about the strange disappearances that had happened over the years. Gideon, you ever hear about the folks that went missing around these parts, he asked, his eyes narrowing. Can't say I have Reuben, I replied, taking a swig of my beer. What happened to them? Well, it's a bit of a mystery. Every few years, someone just up and vanishes. No trace, no clues, nothing. The locals say it's the work of the werewolf, Reuben said, his voice dropping to a whisper as if the creature might be listening. I chuckled. Come on, Reuben. You expect me to believe that? Reuben shrugged. Believe what you want, but folks around here take it seriously. They say it's been happening for decades. My granddad even claimed to have seen it once. A hulking beast with glowing eyes and fangs like knives. Sounds like a campfire story to me, I said, trying to mask my unease with humor. But it's a good one, I'll give you that. Reuben gave me a long look. Just be careful, Gideon. This place has secrets and some of them are better left alone. I laughed it off, but that night I couldn't shake the feeling that Reuben's words held a kernel of truth. I chalked it up to an overactive imagination and went to bed, trying to put the thought of werewolves out of my mind. A few weeks later, I had a photography gig in a nearby town. I spent the day shooting and decided to take the long way home, hoping to catch some good shots of the landscape at dusk. The light was perfect, casting an ethereal glow over the rolling hills and dense forests. As I drove through a particularly remote stretch of road, my car started to sputter. Before I knew it, it had died completely, leaving me stranded in the middle of nowhere. Cursing my luck, I got out and popped the hood, but I didn't know the first thing about fixing cars. I was about to start walking when I heard something rustling in the woods nearby. I glanced around, suddenly aware of how isolated I was. The sun was dipping below the horizon and shadows were creeping across the landscape hoping it was just a deer or some other harmless animal. There was no response, but the rustling continued getting closer. My heart started to race as I realized that whatever it was, it was heading straight for me. I backed away from the car, my eyes scanning the tree line. And then I saw it. At first it was just a shadow, a dark shape moving between the trees. But as it emerged into the fading light, I got a good look at it. It was massive, at least seven feet tall, with long, shaggy fur and eyes that seemed to glow with an unnatural light. Its face was a twisted snarl of fangs and claws, more beast than man. I stood there, frozen in terror, as it started to move towards me. In a flash of instinct, I turned and ran, sprinting down the road as fast as I could. I could hear the creature behind me, its heavy footsteps pounding against the ground. I didn't dare look back, fear driving me forward. I stumbled upon a small cabin, its windows dark and shuttered. Without thinking, I ran to the door and pounded on it, hoping against hope that someone was home. The door creaked open and an elderly woman peeked out. Please, you have to let me in. I gasped. There's something out there. The woman's eyes widened in fear and she pulled me inside, slamming the door shut behind me. What did you see? She asked, her voice trembling. A creature, I stammered, a werewolf. The woman's face went pale. It's come back she whispered. We thought it was gone for good. What do you mean? I asked, trying to catch my breath. The werewolf. It's been hunting these woods for years. My husband went out one night to check on the livestock and never came back. I saw it myself once a long time ago. It's real, and it's dangerous. I looked around the cabin, noting the heavy wooden shutters and reinforced door. You've been preparing for this, haven't you? The woman nodded. We've all heard the stories, but most folks don't believe them. I've always been ready, just in case. 
We sat in silence, the weight of the situation sinking in. Outside, the night was eerily quiet. I could feel the tension in the air, a palpable sense of dread. Then, without warning, there was a loud crash. The door shook as something massive slammed against it. The woman grabbed a shotgun from the corner and handed it to me. Take this, she said. You're going to need it. I took the gun, my hands trembling. What about you? I've got another one, she said, brandishing a rifle. We'll make our stand here. The creature continued to batter the door, and I could see the wood starting to splinter. I braced myself, knowing that we didn't have much time. Finally, the door gave way, and the werewolf burst into the cabin. It was even more terrifying up close, its eyes blazing with a feral intensity. The woman fired first, the shot echoing through the cabin. The creature staggered but didn't go down. I aimed the shotgun and fired, the recoil nearly knocking me off my feet. The werewolf roared in pain, but it kept coming, its eyes fixed on me. I fired again and again, each shot chipping away at the monster's resolve. The woman kept shooting, her face set in grim determination. Together we drove the creature back, each shot weakening it further. Finally, with one last desperate lunge, it collapsed to the floor, its body twitching as it took its final breaths. We stood there, panting and exhausted, the cabin filled with the acrid smell of gunpowder. The woman lowered her rifle and looked at me. It's over, she said, her voice trembling. We did it. I nodded, feeling a wave of relief wash over me. The creature was dead, but the memory of that night would stay with me forever. In the aftermath, the town was abuzz with the news of the werewolf's death. People were skeptical at first, but the evidence was undeniable. The creature's body was taken away by authorities and the disappearances stopped. Life slowly returned to normal, but I could never shake the feeling that something dark still lingered in those woods. I moved away a few months later, needing to put as much distance between myself and that place as possible. I still think about it sometimes, the terror and the adrenaline of that night. I've told my story to a few people, but most of them just laugh it off as a tall tale. But I know what I saw, and I know what we did. The woman, whose name I later learned was Edith, became a bit of a local legend herself. She stayed in that cabin, always prepared, always vigilant. We kept in touch for a while, sharing a bond forged in the heat of battle. And as for me, I kept on with my photography, always with an eye on the shadows, always wary of what might be lurking just out of sight. Because once you've faced a monster, you never forget, and you never stop looking over your shoulder. So that's my story. Believe it or don't, it makes no difference to me. But if you ever find yourself in a small town with a history of disappearances, keep your wits about you. You never know what might be waiting in the dark. When I was 15 years old, I lived with my father in a small house on the outskirts of a quiet town surrounded by dense forests. My father worked as a lumberjack and knew the forest like the back of his hand. We relied on the natural resources of the forest for many of our needs and among these resources was the valuable ginseng plant. On a quiet autumn day, my father decided to take me with him on a ginseng hunting trip. I was extremely excited as this was the first time he had allowed me to accompany him on such a mission. We woke up early at sunrise and after a quick breakfast, we packed our gear and set off towards the forest. The forest that day was full of life. Sunbeams were sneaking between the tree branches casting dancing shadows on the ground covered with colorful autumn leaves. There was a gentle breeze blowing through the trees, creating a soft and refreshing rustle. Birds were chirping with different sounds, and we would occasionally hear the sound of a squirrel jumping between branches or a deer passing lightly between the trees. We began our journey by walking on a narrow path that deepened into the forest. My father was explaining to me how to recognize the ginseng plant and its preferred growing locations. I listened attentively, trying to absorb all the information he was providing. As time passed, we began to search seriously for the precious plant. As we searched, I felt excited and enthusiastic. I wanted to prove to my father that I could find ginseng on my own. But this enthusiasm made me lose focus on my surroundings. I began to drift away from my father without realizing it, engrossed in searching among shrubs and rocks. As time went on, I found myself in a part of the forest I had never seen before. The trees here were denser, the shadows deeper. Suddenly I realized I could no longer hear my father's voice. 
I looked around anxiously, trying to determine the direction I'd come from, but everything looked the same. At that moment, I noticed a strange change in the forest. The sounds that had filled the place just moments ago suddenly disappeared. There was no more bird song, no rustling of leaves, not even the sound of wind. The silence was complete and terrifying. I felt shivers running through my body. There was a strange feeling of being watched. I tried to convince myself it was just an illusion, but the feeling was too strong to ignore. I started to move slowly, trying to maintain my calm and return to the path I had come from. And suddenly, from the corner of my eye, I saw something moving very quickly between the trees. It was a dark shadow, too fast for me to determine its shape. I quickly turned towards where I had seen the movement, but there was nothing there. Just silent trees and shadows. My heart was beating fast, and I began to feel fear creeping into my depths. I tried to call out to my father, but my voice came out weak and trembling. There was no response. I started walking faster, trying to get away from this dark part of the forest. But no matter how much I walked, it seemed I wasn't making any progress. The trees looked similar, and the darkness was increasing around me even though it was still daytime. And suddenly, I heard a sound unlike anything I had ever heard in my life. It was a scream, but it wasn't a human or animal scream. It was a demonic scream a sound that can't be described in words. The sound was so loud that it seemed to come from every direction at once, creating a kind of sonic vortex around me. The scream was so powerful that I could no longer hear anything else. I felt as if the sound was penetrating my body, paralyzing my senses. I couldn't move, I couldn't think. All I could feel was intense terror and the feeling of being trapped in an inescapable nightmare. I don't know how long the situation lasted, Maybe it was minutes, maybe it was hours. All I remember is that everything around me became pitch black, and then I lost consciousness. When I regained consciousness, I found myself in a brightly lit white room. There was a faint buzzing sound of medical devices, and I felt a sharp pain in my right arm. I realized I was in the hospital. After a while, my father entered the room. His face was pale and exhausted, and his eyes were red as if he hadn't slept for days. When he saw me awake, he ran towards me and hugged me tightly, as if afraid I might disappear again. After he calmed down a bit, he began to explain what had happened. He said that when he realized I had disappeared, he started searching for me everywhere. He spent hours calling my name and searching every spot in the forest. As night fell, he called search and rescue teams for help. The search continued throughout the night and into the next morning. Finally, my father found me in an area far from where we had been searching for ginseng. I was lying at the bottom of a dry creek bed, about a mile from the trail we had entered the forest on. My arm was broken and I was unconscious. No one could explain how I ended up in that distant area. There were no footprints indicating that I had walked there, and there was no evidence of what had happened to me. I stayed in the hospital for several days to recover and undergo tests. Doctors and psychologists tried to understand what had happened to me, but they couldn't provide any logical explanation. Some suggested that I might have experienced a panic attack that led to hallucinations, while others suggested that I might have suffered a head injury that led to temporary memory loss. But I know that what happened was real. The fear I felt, the scream I heard, was more real than anything I had ever felt in my life. Even today, years after this incident, I still wake up some nights hearing the echo of that scream in my ears. Since that day, I have never returned to that forest. My father tried to convince me to go back with him on other trips, but I strongly refused. The memories were still vivid and painful. As time passed, I began to hear stories from local residents about similar strange events that had occurred in that forest. Stories of strange sounds, unexplainable phenomena, and people who were lost for short periods and then found in a state of shock. But most people ignored these stories, considering them mere local myths. My mission since then has been to warn people about the dangers of going into the forest alone. I tell my story to anyone who will listen, and I warn them not to ignore the signs of danger. I always tell them, if you find yourself in the forest and suddenly absolute silence prevails, get out of there as fast as you can. Don't wait to find out what might happen. Some believe me, others think I'm crazy, but I don't care. I know what I saw, what I heard, and what I felt. 
and I know that there are things in this world that can't be explained by logic or science. Sometimes, when I look at the forest from my house window, I feel that feeling again. The feeling that something is watching me, waiting. And in those moments I close the curtains and try to forget. But I know I will never forget. And I hope my story serves as a warning to others. The forest may be beautiful and full of life, but it may also hide secrets and dangers beyond imagination. Be careful and always pay attention to your surroundings. You may not get a second chance like I did. In the rolling hills of 1950s Czechoslovakia, nestled between dense forests and sprawling farmlands, lay the small village of Brezova. It was a place where time seemed to move at its own leisurely pace, where traditions were held dear, and where the whispers of the ancient woods that surrounded the settlement were both revered and feared. Maria Novak, a spirited girl of 15, lived with her parents in a modest cottage on the outskirts of Brezova. Her father, Joseph, was the village carpenter, known for his skilled hands and intricate woodwork. Her mother, Elena, kept their home and tended to a small vegetable garden that supplied much of their daily fare. Maria was different from many of the other village children. While they were content with the simple life Brezova offered, she yearned for more. She devoured books whenever she could get her hands on them, dreaming of far-off places and adventures beyond the confines of their small community. This thirst for knowledge and excitement often led her to push boundaries, much to her mother's chagrin. The village itself was a close-knit community where everyone knew each other's business. The central square boasted a small church with a weathered steeple, a general store that doubled as the post office, and a modest schoolhouse where children of all ages gathered to learn. On weekends, the square came alive with a bustling market, where farmers from neighboring villages would come to sell their produce and livestock. But it was the forest that truly defined Brezova. The vast expanse of trees surrounded the village on three sides, a sea of green that changed with the seasons. In spring, it burst forth with new life, the ground carpeted with wildflowers. Summer saw it lush and vibrant, providing cool shade from the scorching sun. Autumn painted it in a riot of reds, oranges, and golds, and in winter its bare branches stood stark against the snow-laden sky, like sentinels guarding ancient secrets. The villagers had a complex relationship with the forest. It provided them with wood for their homes and fires, game for their tables, and mushrooms and berries for their pantries. But it was also a place of mystery and danger. Parents warned their children not to venture too deep into the woods, spinning tales of creatures that lurked in the shadows and spirits that could lead unwary travelers astray. Maria, however, saw the forest differently. To her, it was a place of wonder and possibility. She loved to explore its winding paths, discovering hidden glades and babbling brooks. The forest spoke to her in a language she couldn't quite understand but felt deep in her bones. It was a siren call that she found increasingly difficult to resist. Little did Maria know that her innocent love for the forest would soon lead her into an encounter that would challenge everything she thought she knew about the world and herself. About an hour's walk from Brezova, through the heart of the forest or along the winding road that skirted its edges, lay the village of Lipova. While similar in many ways to Brezova, Lipova had a few amenities that made it a draw for the youth of the surrounding area. Chief among these was the community center, which boasted a table tennis setup that had become the focal point of social gatherings for teenagers from both villages. It was in Lipova that Maria had found a group of kindred spirits. There was Tomas, a lanky boy with a mop of unruly dark hair and a quick wit that often got him into trouble. Eva, with her long blonde braids and infectious laugh, who shared Maria's love of books and often traded novels with her. And then there was Carol, quiet and thoughtful, whose deep brown eyes seemed to hold secrets of their own. Maria had first met them during one of the intervillage festivals that were held twice a year. They had bonded over their shared love of table tennis and their desire for something more than the simple village life their parents seemed content with. Since then, Maria had made it a point to visit Lipova as often as she could, using any excuse to make the journey. Her parents, while initially hesitant about her frequent trips to the neighboring village, had come to accept it as a normal part of teenage life. They set rules, of course. She was to be home before dark, to always let them know when she was going, 
and to never, under any circumstances, travel through the forest alone. For the most part, Maria adhered to these rules. She understood her parents' concerns, even if she didn't fully share them. The forest, after all, could be dangerous if one wasn't careful. There were tales of people getting lost, of sudden storms that could disorient even the most experienced woodsmen, and, of course, the old legends that spoke of things that defied explanation. But Maria couldn't help but feel a thrill every time she stepped into the cool shade of the trees. The forest path to Lipova was well-worn and easy to follow, cutting the journey time nearly in half. The temptation to take this shortcut was always there, especially when she was running late or when the summer sun beat down mercilessly on the exposed road. As spring turned to summer that year, Maria found herself making the trip to Lipova more and more frequently. Her friends there represented a window to a wider world, one filled with possibilities that Brazova couldn't offer. They talked about cities they'd like to visit, books they'd read that opened their minds to new ideas and dreams of what they might become. It was during one of these visits that Maria's life would take an unexpected turn, setting in motion a chain of events that would haunt her for years to come. The day started like any other. Maria woke early, helped her mother with the morning chores, and then set off for Lipova. She had promised to meet her friends for a table tennis tournament they had organized. The summer sun was high in the sky as she set out, taking the longer road around the forest's edge. The tournament was a lively affair, with teenagers from both villages competing fiercely but good-naturedly. Maria found herself caught up in the excitement, the hours slipping by unnoticed as she played match after match. It was only when she glanced out the window and saw the sun hanging low on the horizon that she realized how late it had gotten. Panic seized her. She had promised her parents she'd be home well before dark, and now she was facing a journey that would certainly see her breaking that promise. Her friends offered to walk her home, but Maria declined. She knew they'd get in trouble with their own parents if they returned to Lipova too late. As she stood at the edge of the village, Maria faced a dilemma. The road around the forest would take at least an hour, ensuring she'd be walking in complete darkness for most of the journey. The forest path, on the other hand, would get her home in half the time. She knew it was against her parents' rules, but surely, she reasoned, it would be safer to get home quickly than to spend more time out in the open. With a deep breath, Maria made her decision. She turned towards the forest path, its entrance a dark tunnel between the trees. As she stepped onto the familiar trail, the sounds of the village faded behind her, replaced by the rustle of leaves and the occasional call of a bird settling down for the night. At first the walk was peaceful. The last rays of sunlight filtered through the canopy, creating a dappled pattern on the forest floor. Maria moved quickly, her feet finding the path with ease born of familiarity. She allowed herself to hope that she might make it home before full dark, maybe even before her parents had time to worry. But as the light faded, the forest began to change. Shadows deepened, taking on strange, almost menacing shapes. The friendly chirping of daytime birds gave way to the eerie hoots of owls and the rustling of nocturnal creatures. Maria quickened her pace, her heart beginning to race as the darkness closed in around her. It was then that she noticed something odd. The usual sounds of the forest, the wind in the trees, the scurrying of small animals had all but disappeared. An unnatural silence fell over the woods, broken only by the sound of her own rapid breathing and the crunch of leaves beneath her feet. Maria tried to shake off the growing sense of unease. She was nearly halfway home, she told herself. There was no point in turning back now. But with each step, the feeling that something was terribly wrong grew stronger. The air felt thicker, almost oppressive, and a strange, pungent odor began to permeate the atmosphere. She couldn't quite place the smell. It was earthy, like decaying leaves, but with an underlying sweetness that made her stomach churn. Maria pulled her shawl tighter around her shoulders, though the night wasn't particularly cold. Every instinct screamed at her to run, but she forced herself to maintain a steady pace, afraid that any sudden movement might attract... something. It was then that she heard it, a sound so out of place in the silent forest that it stopped her dead in her tracks. It was a low, guttural noise, somewhere between a growl and a moan, and it was close. Panic overcame reason. Maria darted off the path, 
her only thought to find a place to hide. In the darkness, she stumbled over roots and crashed through underbrush, her breath coming in short, terrified gasps. She ran until her lungs burned and her legs trembled, finally collapsing against the trunk of a massive oak tree. As she huddled there, trying to quiet her breathing, Maria realized she had made a terrible mistake. In her blind panic, she had lost the path. She was now well and truly lost in a forest that suddenly seemed vast and alien. The tree at her back was her only anchor in a world that had become a swirling mass of shadows and unfamiliar sounds. Tears welled up in her eyes as the full weight of her situation settled upon her. She was alone, lost, and something unknown was out there in the darkness. As she clung to the tree, Maria prayed for morning to come quickly, for surely in the light of day she would be able to find her way home. But the night was far from over, and Maria's ordeal was only beginning. Time seemed to lose all meaning as Maria huddled against the old oak tree. The darkness was absolute, broken only by brief glimpses of the moon when the wind parted the leaves overhead. Every sound, Every rustle in the underbrush sent a fresh wave of terror through her body. She strained her eyes and ears, desperate to catch any sign of the thing that had chased her off the path. But the forest remained eerily silent. As the hours crawled by, exhaustion began to set in. Maria's legs ached from running, and her back was sore from pressing against the rough bark of the tree. But she dared not move, convinced that any sound she made would bring that creature right to her. In an attempt to calm herself, Maria tried to think rationally about her situation. Surely by now her parents would have realized she was missing. They would organize a search party. All she had to do was wait until morning and then she could call out for help. The thought brought a small measure of comfort, but it was quickly overshadowed by the realization of how worried and angry her parents must be. As she sat there, alternating between fear and guilt, Maria became aware of a gradual change in her surroundings. The pungent odor she had noticed earlier was growing stronger. It seemed to seep from the very ground, a cloying sweetness mixed with the musty smell of decay. The air felt thicker, almost syrupy, making each breath a conscious effort. Then slowly, almost imperceptibly at first, Maria realized that the texture of the tree bark against her back was changing. What had been rough and unyielding was becoming softer, almost pliant. In her terror-addled state, she initially dismissed it as a trick of her exhausted mind. But as the sensation persisted, a new fear began to take hold. Hesitantly, Maria reached behind her to touch the tree trunk. Her fingers sank into what felt like damp, spongy flesh. With a strangled cry, she tried to push herself away from the tree, but found that she couldn't move. It was as if the tree had molded itself around her, holding her in a gentle but unyielding embrace. Panic overtook her once more. Maria thrashed and struggled, trying desperately to free herself from the tree's grasp. But the more she fought, the tighter it seemed to hold her. Tendrils of bark, or what looked like bark in the dim moonlight, began to creep around her arms and legs, securing her more firmly to the trunk. As she struggled, Maria became aware of a low, rhythmic sound. It took her several moments to realize that it was coming from within the tree itself, a slow, steady pulse like a massive alien heartbeat. The realization sent a fresh wave of terror through her body. Time lost all meaning as Maria remained trapped in the tree's embrace. She drifted in and out of consciousness, her mind unable to fully process what was happening to her. In her more lucid moments, she wondered if this was some sort of dream or hallucination brought on by fear and exhaustion. But the pulsing of the tree and the feeling of bark-like tendrils against her skin felt all too real. As the night wore on, Maria's fear began to give way to a strange sense of calm. The tree's embrace, while still frightening, no longer felt threatening. Instead, there was an almost comforting quality to it, as if the tree was protecting her from the dangers of the forest. In her half-conscious state, Maria found herself sinking her breathing with the slow pulse of the tree. She began to have vivid, dreamlike visions. She saw the forest as it had been centuries ago pristine and untouched by human hands. She saw ancient rituals performed in hidden groves, heard whispered secrets in a language long forgotten. The visions flowed through her mind like water, leaving behind fragments of knowledge that she couldn't quite grasp. As the first light of dawn began to filter through the leaves, 
Maria felt the tree's grip on her begin to loosen. Slowly, gently, the bark-like tendrils retreated, allowing her to slip free. She fell to her knees on the forest floor, her legs weak and unsteady. Looking up at the tree that had held her captive through the night, Maria was struck by how ordinary it appeared in the morning light. There was no sign of the pulsing, living entity she had experienced. It was just an old oak tree, its bark rough and unyielding. Disoriented and exhausted, Maria stumbled to her feet. To her surprise, she immediately recognized where she was. The path home was just a few yards away, clearly visible in the growing light. Had it been there all along? Her mind reeled, unable to reconcile her nightmarish experience with the benign forest around her. With shaky steps, Maria made her way onto the path and began the journey home. Her body ached and her clothes were dirty and torn, but she was alive. As she walked, she tried to make sense of what had happened to her. Was it all a dream? A hallucination brought on by fear and exhaustion? Or had she experienced something truly supernatural? Something that defied explanation? These questions swirled in her mind as she approached the outskirts of Brizova. The village was just waking up, smoke rising from chimneys as people began their day. Maria's steps quickened as she neared her home, a mix of relief and apprehension filling her heart. She had no idea how she would explain her absence to her parents, or if they would even believe her if she told them the truth. As she reached her front door, Maria took a deep breath, steeling herself for the confrontation to come. She raised her hand to knock, unaware that the events of the night were far from over, and that her return would bring with it a new set of mysteries and challenges. Maria's knuckles had barely grazed the wooden door when it flew open, revealing her mother's face, etched with a mixture of relief, anger, and confusion. Maria, where have you been? We've been worried sick, Alina exclaimed, pulling her daughter into a fierce embrace. Before Maria could respond, her father appeared behind her mother, his usually kind face stern with concern. Young lady, you have a lot of explaining to do, Joseph said, his voice tight with suppressed emotion. Maria opened her mouth to speak, to begin explaining her terrifying ordeal in the forest, but her mother cut her off. We've been calling for you for over an hour. How could you ignore us like that? Confusion washed over Maria. Calling for me, but I just got home. I was in the forest all night. I couldn't hear you, she stammered. Her parents exchanged worried glances. Maria, her father said slowly, you came home last night. You've been in your room for hours. We thought you were angry with us for some reason and refusing to answer when we called you for dinner. Maria felt as if the ground had dropped out from beneath her feet. That's impossible, she whispered. I was in the forest, the tree. It held me all night. I only just got free at dawn. Her parents' expressions shifted from anger to 